but welcome to Mox Spies and Timers, oh my. Uh, I am Lisa Backer. I'm a senior software engineer at Dockyard. Uh, we're a consulting agency, essentially. This is my family. You can tell a couple, uh, well, at least one thing here, that I do wear Ember clothes in like the real world. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, my husband, my two kids, and of course my in-laws lining the back. So to get serious, we all know that Ember is uh, for ambitious applications, um, and it has a very ambitious approach to testing. Uh, and that's one of the things that really sets it apart from some other frameworks, and it's a real strength. Um, in the guides, we actually have four different ways to set up tests, and a lot of focus placed there. But I think rather than just focusing on quantity, we should be focusing on more thoughtful tests. By that, I mean tests that have a clear focus about what they're trying to test and what they are not. So what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to focus a little bit on the Wizard of Oz. This is Dorothy. Um, in the story of the Wizard of Oz, she, of course, has ruby slippers that she needs to click three times to uh, make some magic happen and make her wish come true, which is to go home to Kansas. Uh, <laughs> so let's see how some Ember tests can work into the Wizard of Oz. Uh, starting with the different types of tests there, we can start with unit because that's where everyone starts. These are for Testing pure functions, inputs and outputs, there's very little, um, little side effects usually here. So something we might want to test with a unit test in our story, just a simple utility function to check if her shoes are magic or not. So is magic shoes is going to return true if she actually has some shoes, and of course if they are ruby for our ruby slippers. A standard kind of unit test here, we just run through and test the inputs and outputs. If we give it the inputs we expect of uh, ruby shoes, they should be in fact magic. Silver would not be, no shoes, also not magic. So what are we testing here? Like I said, straight inputs and outputs, kind of like Ed was talking about in your boundaries. These are, this is the simplest form of inputs and outputs. Uh, they're, yeah, so this is great for utility functions and libs and stuff like that. So the next type of test that Ember can help us set up are container tests. These give you access to the application container, uh, so you can pull things out for your test concept. They're not the actual type of test, it's really the setup for the test. So something we might want to use here would be like a service that we would have to perform some magic. So in this service, we have a make a wish function, and we're going to take in our shoes and a wish that we want to call back. So if we have magic shoes, and if they've been clicked three times, then we'll execute our wish. Simple. So this type of test here, we would go through, and we would get a reference to uh, our service. And we could say that we have a wish that we're going to set up, and this function will have an assertion in it to make sure that we've called it. And then finally, we'll call make a wish on our service, pass in our Ruby slippers, and our wish. This test already feels a little wonky. Um, and you know, we've got, like, we're setting up some assertions. Oh, one more assertion, actually, just to make sure that it fails, right, <laughs> if the test, the callback doesn't happen. So now it feels even wonkier, because now we're asserting something at the beginning. We're getting up a service. We're doing some other things. It's just all washed together. So this violates something that we kind of intrinsically know, and it's called arrange act assert, uh, a pattern for setting up our tests. Typically, uh, you want to arrange, so you arrange all your preconditions or set up the scene, and then you pull form some actions, then you actually assert you got what you expected. Uh, this is the same thing as given when then, if you do BDD stuff. So back to what are we testing? What are we trying to test here? Uh, we're really trying to test that with our magic shoes, we, we get our wish called, right? Um, in this case, we're still just testing inputs and outputs. The container test, it could have been a unit test or an integration test if we were dealing with some other kind of service as well. That's, that's a separate type of lingo. So rendering tests. Uh, usually, usually testing interactions between parts of the UI, UI controls. Uh, we kind of think of these as component tests, right? So let's have a component for Dorothy. When she's happy, we'll show her happy. When she's not, we're going to say, Dorothy is scared and she wants to go home. And we'll give her some shoes. So we'll have a button. If you click those, that button, you'll call an action of there's no place like home. Uh, the code behind this, we'll set up some default state, um, is happy, we'll, uh, and then we'll, have an, we'll get our magic service and we have an action for there's no place like home. And that will increment our clicks on the shoes and call our make a wish function. Uh, if that wish gets executed, what it'll do is say, Dorothy's happy. Uh, and we'll call back anything you might have passed down as being a wish for Dorothy. So let's just test that like the component portion in the visual display part of this works. 
Uh, we're going to set up our Ruby slippers, right? Then we will render Dorothy and make sure our initial state is what we expect it to be. Click her, get her shoes and click them three times, of course. Click, click, click. And then uh, make sure that she is now happy and not sad. Um, pretty simple still. So what are we trying to test here? We're trying to test really what the component could see from the outside, right? So what the user could have clicked on or what some other component could have worked with in here, not really the internal. Finally, the last type, the biggest type, are application tests. These are usually testing the application flow, right, and user interactions. Um, they're good for testing out a full stor user story. So in this case, we might have a template for Oz, and we've dropped a Dorothy into Oz, and we've given her some shoes from the model, uh, and then we pass down an action of when we make a wish to go home. And then on a controller, <laughs> we could have an action <laughs> that says go home. Uh, in this go home, we'll transition her to Kansas. So to set a test for this make-a-wish um, user story here, we're going to go ahead and create a model with our Ruby slippers in it so that we can pass that down. We're going to visit Oz. We're going to click her shoes three times again. And then we're going to make sure that she is now in Kansas as we expect her to be. So finally, what are we testing in this one? This is really the flow and the routing and the stuff that your user or end user would have interacted with. So how many of you, first of all, how many of you knew that The Wizard of Oz was a book more than three days ago? <laughs> how many of you know what color the slippers are in the book? Anybody want to shout it out? Very good. <laughs> so they are silver shoes. <laughs> They made them red in the movie just because it popped more, uh, like animation. Yeah, so in the movies, they made them red. <laughs> uh, it was kind of like the, or one of the earlier color movies. So it just was a, a film choice. So anyway, our application should, should be true to the original. We're using original illustrations here. So we've got our, our, our core function, which of course we'll need to change to check for silver shoes. And then as expected, we would need to update our unit test because now Ruby should be false and silver should be true. Our container test, now we're going to have to go ahead and, and change that one to silver. A rendering test, going to change that one to silver. Application test, change that one. And eventually we're going to say, tests are dumb. I spent all my time writing tests. I never get to do any code. This isn't what I signed up for. <laughs> and it's really that we've let everything leak all over the place, and we have no boundaries to what we're testing anymore. Like I said, what are we testing? We don't care that our shoes are silver or red, except for at that unit level. Beyond that, we just need to know if they're magic. And this is called the, the system under test, focusing on the system under test. Um, the actual definition says whatever we are testing. Uh, and it's designed from the uh, perspective of the test. Once again, it's, it's really the inputs and outputs that your, that piece of code that you are exposing to your other pieces of code uh, can see. So what if we could leave those other dependencies out of this and just not worry about them and only focus on our system under test? This is where test doubles come in. So test doubles, or munchkins, um, they were originally named for stunt doubles. So they stand in for things that are too hard or too irrelevant for the big important actor to be able to do. Uh, let's. Take a look at what we could do with our application if we had some test doubles thrown in. One of the big common ways right now, that's an interesting approach. Um, one of the big common ways right now for doing this is a framework called SignOn. Uh, it's fairly popular, it's used, been used for a long time. Um, fun fact, it's actually named for a Greek warrior, SignOn, who uh, was part of smuggling in a big wooden horse for the Greeks. Um, so that's kind of a, a fun little naming thing there. Uh, this is, I like, I like the, the concept slippery words before. So slippery words are used throughout the concept of mocking in definitions, and they have changed over time. So I'm going to introduce concepts as they are termed in sign-on, but that's not necessarily what you'll always read, so just be warned. So let's start with spies. Uh, a test spy can record information about a function that's called. It will record how many times it's called, what it's called with, what the this is at the time it's called, uh, any exceptions, all of that. It doesn't do anything about it, uh, and it still lets the call go through in sign-on, but it does record the information about it. 
So here we had our, our wonky test, right? Yes, this is our wonky test. So we have our, our, our assert at the top and our wish going on and all sorts of strange things. So let's clean this up with a spy instead. We're going to use sign on to create a spy. Uh, and then we're going to get our service. So now we've done our precondition, we've done our arrange. We're going to do our actions, which is we're going to make a wish on our service. And then we're going to assert that our wish was called once. So now things feel a lot cleaner. <laughs> That's called an anonymous spy uh, because it doesn't actually wrap any particular function. We're just throwing it in there to see if it's getting called. Uh, the spies can also wrap. And one thing I'm doing here, which I actually didn't realize was not an Embry thing until today, um, is to import star from shoe utils. So what I'm doing here is to be able to get a reference to shoe utils so that I can refer to the functions that are defined on it. Uh, because I really want to get to that is magic shoes. So I'm going to create a spy and I'm going to tell it I want to spy on shoe utils and specifically on the is magic shoes function. And then I'm going to render Dorothy. Sounds weird. Um, <laughs> <laughs> get a reference to her shoes, click them three times, and then uh, first of all, make sure she's happy still because it did go, the call did go through, um, but also that my spy is going to tell me, yeah, is magic shoes was actually called three times. Each time got validated as it was supposed to. Um, now, the, there's a little trick in here that I did, well, probably multiple things wrong, but one thing very wrong uh, is that shoe utils, that spy is continuing in my test unless I were to clean it up. And I will get back to that later about some ways that Ember can really help you there. Uh, so stubs. Stubs are like, in sign-on, stubs are like spies but with a little more. Uh, they replace the function completely with your mock implementation and this was introduced to us earlier. Um, so something that just gives you a quick like, you can give a switch in your, an if statement in your code to say, you know, the standard is if I get a 404 back from my server, I want to make sure I get my error pass and uh, forcing those kinds of scenarios. But you are getting rid of the original code, so you're kind of picking out its brain. So let's go look at our make a wish function. Um, so one thing that always bothered me in the Wizard of Oz is that like Dorothy has the power to go home whenever she wants and nobody tells her this. Right? The wizard just kind of messes with her and has her do all this stuff. And then at the very end, he's like, oh, you could have gone home all along. Um, <laughs> so we're going to inject a little chaos here. Instead of just having the shoes get incremented each time she clicks, or the shoe click count, let's go out and get a random number generator. So anytime she goes to click her shoes, she's going to get some random number. And if it happens to be three, yay, you, you get your wish. Now, we, we've introduced chaos on ourselves as well here because now we're, we're awaiting an AJAX request. Our tests are going to have to wait for that AJAX request. That service might not be there tomorrow. It might not work the same way. It might require a new one of those query parameters. Uh, and it might even rate limit us. It could do anything. So let's get rid of this part in our test. In our magic service, we can create a stub on the AJAX uh, service of the request function. And we can do things like saying, I, you know, I want it to resolve differently based on which time we call it or calling it with different parameters. Uh, there's a, a lot of endless combinations you could do here. And in this case, you know, we're using resolve because we're dealing with a promise. So it does handle asynchronous behavior as well as synchronous. I'm going to render Dorothy again with those shoes. Um, get a reference to them and click them. The first time we click them, we're going to see that she's still happy, uh, or she's not happy, sorry, because we've, we haven't returned the magic three. The second time we click them, we're saying that we're going to return that magic three, and so we, we can assert that she really is happy now. And we can also, just like a spy, check and make sure that it was called two times. Later on, sign-on created something called fakes, and this was possibly because those first two were kind of confusing of when you would use one or the other. So a fake really does everything that a spy and a, and, and a stub can do combined. Uh, but it also separates out creating the fake from actually replacing the fake. Um, using that word replace, it also gets rid of this whole concept of sometimes I call my underlying function and sometimes I don't. So it can be used both ways that a spy can be used. If we had our, our anonymous before here where we just created a sign-on spy for our wish, in order to change this to a fake, all we need to do is call sign on fake instead. For wrapping things, it gets slightly different just because we're separating out how the creation from the usage. So we're going to create a new fake and give it that implementation. I don't know why I decided to make it false. I guess I'm just mean today. 
and then uh, replace it, tell it that where we're replacing is magic shoes with this specific fake that we created. The last thing in there are mocks. Um, and mocks wrap up all of this plus the expectations. So you define upfront what you expect to see and how you expect your fake or your test double really to be used. Um, with all that stuff jammed in there, they do get a little more complicated. So let's say we're mocking our is magic shoes again still and we're trying to validate that it's getting called the right number of times. We can, we, in one giant sentence, we can say, I have a mock and I expect is magic shoes to be called exactly three times. And by the way, I'm going to return true this time. You render out Dorothy again, get her shoes, click them three times, slide yada yada. Uh, then finally at the end, we have this mock.verify, and that's what's going to go through and check that any single assertion you set up, and there could be multiple of them, um, are, are going to get verified and will fail the test if they don't. So the documentation is fairly decent in sign on, but, but it's very, it doesn't tell you when really to use something, but it does do a good job of explaining what they are. Um, and, but just to help understand a little bit and reiterate what these things are. So a spy, it's great if you want to verify that a callback was called or uh, with specific inputs and such. A stub is great when you need to simulate different responses from something that's either complicated or you, that's hard to get to or, or really just hard to set up in your test. A fake is when you really just can't remember whether to use a spy or a stub. It's, it, that's, that's really the one you like. <laughs> And mocks. Uh, or if you like setting up your assertions at the beginning and you don't like a range act assert, you know, great, this is for you. It's, it's not one I use very much, so I, I definitely recommend just sticking with shapes. Now, timers. One more thing that sign on can do that uh, I have to get into a little bit here mostly because it's in the title of the talk. Um, <laughs> sign on has the ability to essentially stop time for you. Uh, it, it actually does a little bit of magic. So when you use sign-on's fake timers, which is also the same as using Lolex, if you've heard of that, Lolex is the underlying library that sign-on uses that can be used independently. What it'll do, it'll go ahead and take all of these different timing functions that you use in JavaScript and replace them with its own, essentially, test doubles. Um, this can be really helpful if you're trying to test some sort of function, uh, either to speed up something, right, that's going to take a while in your test. It can also be helpful if you need to stop and test that something happened at a particular point and then continue the functionality after that. Let's say user interacts with something and it doesn't clear or whatnot. So for a very simple example here, um, Dorothy was able to go home to Kansas after she clicked her heels. Well, this is a movie. This is the end of the movie. This is like the big part. You don't want to just send her there. That's, that's so anticlimactic. We need to give her some suspense, right? So we're going to wait five seconds and say, will she make it? And then we'll send her to Kansas. <laughs> so I want to test this. I'm going to go through, and, I, and I'm going to go to Oz, and I'm going to click her heels three times, and I'm going to make sure she's still in Oz. And I don't know what I'm going to do here. Somehow I'm going to wait, and then I'm going to see that she goes to Kansas. Uh, if I was going to use fake timers to help with this, I would call sign on, use fake timers, and I get a reference to what they, what they generally refer to in the docs as the clock. Go to Oz, click the shoes three times. Uh, now I can check that I am still at Oz. Then I can use my clock. I could either run it ahead a certain period of time if I wanted to say after one second she's still in Oz and after two seconds, or I could just say run them all, get it to the end, and I just want to see the end result of all my timing things catching up. Um, I'm doing an await settled here so I can give Ember some time to go ahead and do the transitions, and then I'll check that she's in Oz. Now, there are some, uh, I'd be happy to talk to you later if we have something. Uh, no, it happens synchronously, it happens immediately. Yeah, that's, that's great actually. It doesn't, you don't have to wait actually for that five seconds to pass when you call that. It, it just goes. Um, magic. <laughs> I can't snap. <laughs> Anyway, sorry, uh, where were we? Oh, there are some weird things when you get into dealing with the Amber Run Loop um, and timers, and uh, it, it totally can be done. 
but there, there are definitely some oddball things. There are some posts on Dr. Ed's blog that we've done about it, and I'm sure there are people here that have written some tests, and I've, I've been told that Lulex is even used in the Ember test, so they, they understand the dragons. So how do you sign on in Ember? There's, uh, if you go to Ember Observer and you search for sign on, there's several add-ons that come up, so I just want to give you a quick tour of what those are so that you know what, what's what there. Uh, Ember sign on is basically the wrapper for pulling in sign on. It's kind of a base level package. There's Ember Sign On Key Unit and Ember Sign On Chai. We're both uh, kind of created as the, the different flavors of that initially, I think. And then the Chai one got deprecated for Ember CLI Chai. And then this again is just a wrapper. It's just pulling things in. So you're still, if you're going that route, you do still need to deal with cleanups. You do need to deal with all your test setup. You'll want to look into something called Sign On Sandbox. Um, these are all things that you'll have to worry about. For that, there's a uh, add-on called Ember Sign On Sandbox that was mostly concerned, I think, with trying to set up that sandbox appropriately and provide it to you. Um, then it became Ember Sign On Sign Off to make sure that you would get, <laughs> that you could, could I, it's a great name, um, to make sure that you could actually clean up from all your tests and try to, to tackle that story for you. Um, and then all that got wrapped back into Ember Sign On QUnit. Uh, and fairly recently, there was a new release there where it handles um, both setting up all your, setting up sign-on for all your tests, cleaning up all of your state afterwards so you don't leak into other tests, uh, and also exposing sign-on directly for you so that if you're, anything you see in the sign-on documentation you have access to as opposed to some proxied wrapped version. So there are other things out there. Uh, there is test double, it's kind of a relative newcomer to the scene, and uh, part of it seems to be a response to sign on complication. Uh, this was written um, as more of a minimalist approach, and actually they declared it to be their opinionated test, test system. So um, I know we like opinionated things around here. Uh, basically they thought, you know, there's too many overlapping types, and it leaves people overwhelmed and confused, so hence the opinion. Just some quick features of test double. Basically, all that Spock, uh, Spock, spies, <laughs> stubs, and uh, fakes all get combined into a single function. So you have, if you import it as TD, for example, it'd be TD.function. It also can do uh, simple replace language, just like you know what you saw in the fake section in sign on. Uh, and it's always replacing, which I probably put later in the slide. So. It allows for dynamic object stubbing where you can pass it an object and it'll automatically stub out all the functions that are defined on it. Um, and I should point out this is something sign-on can do as well, but only if you use the stub syntax. So once again, it's a little, you have to catch those things. There it is. Always replaces rather than wrapping. <laughs> so there's never this confusion about am I going to call my underlying code or not. It's just always going to replace it. Um, in addition for its introspection, in, in addition to just getting your call counts and getting um, you know, what you called with, it also gives you a nice way to summarize uh, how your test double is set up. So you actually want to print out, for example, what's going on with this thing. You can, you can see. There are Ember um, uh, add-ons for these as well. Ember um, CLI test double and then like a chai flavor and a Q-unit flavor. Then if we leave the Ember world and move a little further out, uh, we get to Jest. And Jest is a testing framework that was created for React um, sorry, but it includes uh, assertion as well as mocking capabilities, and it's a pretty robust testing uh, system. It's taken off in Node and TypeScript as well, not just in the React, and yeah, it's, it's pretty high on the downloads lately. So, like I said, it gives you a full set of assertions, um, chai-like syntax, I guess. You know, it's got the nice language. It's saying, expect my function to have been called three times, nice, uh, or expect my function not to have been called. Um, very easy to read. It also allows for automatic mocking, so you can also just pass it an object, but you can also do things like say, I want to import my, I want to mock my entire uh, node module import class, or I want my entire ES6 module import. So those kinds of things can be really handy if you, you don't want to sit there and try to match up each thing. Um, they can be handy for maintenance, as I'll get to later as well. It also gives you the ability to do manual mocks, so you have a folder, for example, where you can just write out um, the, kind of like the stub, what you would have done in your stub if you have something more complicated. It's almost like a fixture for a mock, um, and those can get called automatically in place of your regular code in your test. 
Uh, they have snapshot tests. This is not visual regression tests, but it's kind of like uh, getting a picture of the DOM at one time or uh, the, what the DOM looks like as opposed to not, it's not visual, it's just the code itself. Um, they can include test coverage. The big gotcha here though is it doesn't run in the browser. Uh, it's, it's really, it's a node thing. So there, is, there are some projects called Just Light um, that they've started to look at taking things into the browser. Uh, that it, it looks really promising, however, it doesn't have the mocking capabilities so much as more the assertion library. But I, I would love if it could do more. So if you go seek the elders or read on the internet some stuff about mocking, you're gonna find out that there are some people with strong opinions and they like controversy. And they're gonna say, mocking makes refactoring harder or mocking is a code smell or one more click, mocking violates dry. All right, two more clicks. Um, <laughs> so first of all, you should understand that anytime time these people are talking about mocking that they're mostly talking about test doubles in general, not about mocks specifically. They're also generally uh, talking about unit tests even though we're using mocking mostly in, in other types of tests. As far as making refactoring harder, um, generally, as long as you're looking at the boundaries of your code, sometimes that is internal that you're changing the boundary of that piece of code. And it makes sense that your mocks are going to be updated there. But those auto mocking capabilities, these can help a lot here. As far as mocking being a code smell, uh, really, again, if you try to limit yourself to the public API. For example, if you need to test that something is available in your component, Maybe don't just test the specific hook that you set it up in in Ember, but test that when you need to use it, it's there. Um, they can also be a little bit of a canary in the coal mine, though. If you have a really complicated mock to set up, that does indicate that your code's pretty complicated. Um, that might be necessary complementation, but it might be something you can, you can simplify. And finally, dry, uh, don't repeat yourself. So this concept is really intended to be a single piece of knowledge that shouldn't be repeated, not separate lines of code that shouldn't be repeated. There are times in tests where you will find yourself repeating a couple lines of code and that's okay. You're making your test readable. Your tests are kind of your documentation. So uh, a good practice I'd like to leave you with here is, uh, and, and I'm not gonna rip on Matt a little bit here, don't mock what you don't own. <laughs> so uh, this is not intentional, but uh, it sounds very counterintuitive. Things you don't own are things that you actually usually kind of mock, right? Like your API and your database and your HTTP calls and whatnot. But what this really means is that you should be building a wall between your code and that stuff. Um, and a common approach to doing that in Ember is to have a service. So your code is going to talk to the service and the service is going to talk to those things. That way you can preserve your own little public set of, your set of inputs and outputs. You can test the service. And then when you test your code base, you can throw in your mock. So uh, in our example of chaos, we had that Ajax function. It's screaming to be pulled out. So we can create a heel click service instead, give it a nice, uh, nicely named type of thing, like get click count, and then call off and do our random stuff. It makes our code a little easier to read because now we're just saying heel click dot get click count instead of some weirdo Ajax thing. And finally, when we're stubbing it out, instead of stubbing Ajax request, which felt a little funky, now we're going to get our heel click service and we'll stub that out. So once again, everything reads a little nicer because we're giving it our own application names instead of relying on some third party thing. Uh, one thing to watch out for, people tend to throw in a lot of extra mocks when they are trying to get that magic 100% code coverage number. Um, don't go for 100%, please. Uh, really, a, a good code coverage number does often happen with good code bases and good test suites. Um, but I really like to use them more as a baseline. So as I'm making changes to my code to make sure that my, my coverage isn't going wildly up or down, or I mean, I guess up is good, but wildly down is bad. Um, and that often happens when you're, you start to tr try and jam things in. Really, it all kind of comes down to, again, what are you trying to test? What are the boundaries of your piece of code? And how can you test just that part? And make those other things irrelevant. So that's basically testing behavior, not implementation. Uh, it's, it's making sure that you test what your code is supposed to do, not how it does it. So hopefully you can go to your test suite tomorrow and try to be a little more thoughtful um, and have a few more tools at your disposal for it. So uh, thank you. I'm Eshta, DC, everywhere on the web. And talk to me about Monks or Dockyard or whatever. <laughs>